Chapter 1, Introduction to Clinical Hematology. Hematology is the study of blood and all of the blood-forming organs. Because blood is essential to life, hematology is one of the busiest departments within the clinical laboratory. So we are going to study extensively all of the cellular components of blood itself. So we are going to discuss normal and abnormal development, the physiology and all of the function of the cells within it, as well as how these cells react to a disease process, how death occurs and destruction of the formed elements of the blood, and also how some of those recycled products within the blood are used to make new cells. Blood is composed of a liquid called plasma and of cellular elements, which include white cells, platelets, and red blood cells. The normal adult has about six liters of blood, which is comprised of seven to eight percent of a human's total body weight. Plasma makes up about 55% of the blood volume, and 45% of the volume is composed of these cellular elements. The principal component of plasma is water, which contains dissolved ions, proteins, carbohydrates, hormones, fats, vitamins, and enzymes. The principal ion necessary for normal cell function includes calcium, sodium, potassium, magnesium, hydrogen, and chloride. The main protein constituent of plasma is albumin, which is the most important because it maintains osmotic pressure. It also acts as a carrier molecule, which transports compounds such as bilirubin and heme to where they are needed. All of the cellular components of blood are made within the bone marrow. When we talk about red blood cells or erythrocytes, they are composed about 45% of the total blood volume. They are anucleate when mature. They have a biconcave shape, which means that they kind of indent in the middle and they're filled with a reddish protein called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is very important to sustain life because it transports oxygen to the tissues and removes carbon dioxide from the body. Red blood cells appear pink to red and measure about six to eight microns in diameter with a zone of pallor that occupies one third of the center reflecting their biconcave shape. White blood cells make up about 1% of the total blood volume. They are also called leukocytes. They are loosely related to cell types dedicated to protecting their host from infection and injury. White blood cells are transported in the blood from their source, usually the bone marrow, or lymphoid tissue to their tissue or body cavity destination where they can fight against foreign antigens such as bacteria and viruses. They get their name because they are nearly colorless in any unsane cell suspension. There are five types of white blood cells, monocytes, eosinophils, neutrophils, lymphocytes, and basophils, and we will discuss them in the next slides. Neutrophils are the most abundant of the white blood cells. They are also called segmented neutrophils or polymorphonuclear neutrophils. Their function is to engulf or phagocytize cells and destroy any microorganisms or foreign material present, either directly or after having been labeled for destruction by the immune system. 
The term segmented refers to their multi-lobed nuclei. So in the nucleus, you have two to five of those lobes, which are purple in color. In the cytoplasm is a pinkish color, which contains very fine purple granules within it. Lymphocytes comprise about 25 to 30 5% of the total white blood cell count in normal adult. And they comprise of a complex system of cells that provide host immunity. They recognize foreign antigens and mount a humoral response either by creating antibodies or by a cell mediated response. Most lymphocytes are round and slightly larger than red blood cells. They have round featureless nuclei with a very thin bluish cytoplasm. Monocytes comprise about 2 to 10 percent of the total white blood cell count. They are the largest of the white blood cells and their tasks are to identify and engulf and consume any foreign particles and assist the lymphocytes in mounting an immune response through the assembly and presentation of immunogenic epitopes. On this blood-stained film, they are larger in diameter than any other white blood cells. Their cytoplasm has this bluish gray color with very, very fine granules. The nucleus is large and can be convoluted, usually folded or indented, and the cytoplasm may also contain very large vacuoles. Eosinophils comprise about 0 to 5 percent of the total blood volume in an adult, and they are cells that have two to three lobes of the nucleus and present with very brightly orange or red cytoplasmic granules filled with proteins that are involved in immune system regulation. Basophils comprise about 0 to 2 percent of normal adult total white blood cell count. They have also two to three lobes and their cytoplasm is filled with these dark purple irregular cytoplasmic granules that really can obscure the nucleus. The basophil granules contain histamine and other proteins to help with reduction of hypersensitive reactions. The distribution of basophils and eosinophils in the blood is very small compared to neutrophils. Neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils are collectively called granulocytes because of their prominent cytoplasmic granules, which can alter their function and very specific for their function. Platelets or thrombocytes are true blood cells that maintain the blood vessel integrity by initiating vessel wall repair. They adhere to the surfaces of damaged blood vessels and aggregate with neighboring platelets to plug the blood vessel. Secrete proteins and small molecules that trigger clot formation. Platelets are only 2 to 5 microns in diameter. They are round or oval and have no nucleus and they appear slightly granular. Their small size makes them appear insignificant, but they are very essential to life and are extensively studied for their complex physiology. This table represents the reference interval of a typical adult complete blood count, which is the most common hematological screening test available. The differences in the concentration of cellular elements can occur 
according to race, age, sex, even geographic location. Pathological changes in these concentrations can occur as a result of disease or injury and can alert a physician to what is going on within the patient's body. Now each lab must make up their own reference intervals. They're determined by calculating the mean plus or minus two standard deviations for a group of healthy individuals. The interval represents the interval of 95% of normal individuals and a value just below or above it is not necessarily abnormal, normal, or an abnormal overlap. Stasis is another department within hematology that discusses the process of forming a blood clot to stop blood loss. It is a property of the circulation that maintains blood as a fluid within its blood vessels and the system's ability to form a blood clot to prevent excessive blood loss when there is trauma and limit the barrier to the site of injury as well as dissolve the clot to ensure normal blood flow when the vessel has been repaired. So hemostasis occurs in stages called primary and secondary hemostasis, and then the breakdown of fibrin clot called fibrinolysis. These stages are the result of the interaction of platelets, blood vessels and proteins circulating in the blood. An upset of any of these stages can result in bleeding and abnormal blood clotting called thrombosis. And you will have a separate course on hemostasis. Now another proponent of blood includes blood component therapy, which you will learn in blood banking or transfusion medicine course. But blood components can be used in therapy for various hematologic and non-hematological disorders. They're collected from donors and separated into various cellular and fluid components and only that specific blood component needed by the patient will be administered. And they can be separated into packed red blood cells, platelets, fresh frozen plasma, and cryoprecipitate. Any hematological problem starts at the physician level because they need to investigate patient's symptoms. So a physician will take a medical history and perform a physical exam. Now clues provided by this preliminary investigation will help guide them as a choice of laboratory tests to help confirm a diagnosis. The challenge for a physician is to select the appropriate test that will contribute to cost effectiveness and an efficient diagnosis. So as a laboratory, this usually begins with certain screening tests and based on those results, more specific tests can be ordered. The same test can be ordered again to follow up on disease progression, evaluate treatment, as well as identify any side effects or complications or assist in the prognosis of a patient. Now the most common screening test in hematology is the complete blood count, or CBC. It quantifies the white blood cells in total and breaks out the five cells we talked about earlier. It also counts the red blood cells, hemoglobin, hematocrit, and platelets as well as calculates the red blood cell indices. The indices determine the size and hemoglobin content within the red blood cells to help lead us to what is going on with the patient. They're important to differentiate the causes of anemia to help further direct testing.